If you've spent too much money buying grow lights that shed a harsh glow on your plant collection and don't last for more than a few months, then it's time to give Soltec Solutions a try. Soltec Solutions stylish grow lights give off a warm white glow and come with a five year warranty. So you know these lights are going to last. Choose from Soltec Solutions range of track lights, pendant style lights, or simple bulbs that screw into most standard light fittings. And with Soltec Solutions great customer service, you are going to love your new lights. Check out Soltec Solutions now at soltecsolutions.com and get 15% off with the code on the ledge. That's soltecsolutions.com, enter code on the ledge for 15% off. Need more planty chat in your life? Don't worry, I'm here on the Ledge Podcast, episode 225. Let's go! Welcome to the show. In this episode, I talk to Sininja expert David Zaitlin all about this fascinating genus, focusing on the species Sininja speciosa, the totally OTT and glorious and, well, admittedly a little bit out of fashion, Floris gloxinia, as it's known, and Sininja leucotrica. Perhaps I can say the trendy cousin who's very much in demand right now. Thanks for all the lovely feedback on last week's show from the Chelsea Flower Show. And thanks to Diane for becoming a legend, joining Patreon this week. And Diane has unlocked lots of extra content, including the first 50 episodes of On The Ledge ever made, which are only available to Patreon subscribers at the legend and superfan level and lots of additional episodes in the form of an extra leaf and there'll be a bonus episode with my guest today David Zaitlin coming out in a few days time no question of the week this week but do get your questions to me because there's a Q&A special on the way And thanks to Greg, who got in touch after listening to episode 222 about interesting houseplants making their dent in the houseplant scene. He told me about a plant that he has come across called Argilia radiata. And this is a plant from Chile and Peru. It's got beautiful orangey red flowers and copes with pretty harsh conditions. Not a lot of rainfall and hot temperatures in the summer, and can survive down to about two degrees Celsius in winter. So it's an interesting plant that's being posted as a potential houseplant. It's got a big tuberous root, so that helps it to survive when times get tough during the dry season, when it can just retreat into that large tuber. As Greg puts it, during months of intense drought between rains, it lies in wait as a large underground root. When given water, it sends out new above ground growth. And Greg found one in a nursery in Northern California called Annie's Annuals. I wonder if this is one we're going to be seeing more widely. Thanks for getting in touch, Greg. It's lovely to hear from listeners and I do try to respond to as many of you as I can. And this is the kind of interesting stuff that I love to read about. So Thank you for that, Greg. But now let's talk syringes and a bit of background before we start. For those of you who are not overly familiar with this genus, it's part of the Gisneriad family, which includes things like African violets, Streptocarpus, Primulinas, Petrocosmias, Calerias, the list goes on. And there are many houseplants counted among this family. Most of these plants are loved for their flowers, but sometimes they have pretty nice foliage too. And the two species that we're going to focus on in this interview are Sininja speciosa, 
which is sometimes called the Florus gloxinia. It's not a gloxinia, that's another genus of the Gisneria family, so the usual confusion with names. But Florus gloxinia is a rather interesting plant. It's not very fashionable. I'm hoping, and in fact I'm leading a one-woman campaign right now to get this plant back on plant shop shelves because I think it's amazing. It's grown for its incredibly large, incredibly over-the-top, velvety flowers. It's got large, fuzzy leaves, a bit like an African violet, but bigger. And it grows from a tuber. Maybe this is one of the things that puts people off, but it goes dormant um, and then you keep it cool and dry until it re-sprouts. So I suggest if you want to go and check out this plant in the show notes, I've put some pictures in there of some cultivars of Syningia speciosa. And the second species is Syningia leucotrica. This is a plant that is becoming more and more popular. One of its common names is Brazilian edelweiss. And it's got these incredibly furry, pubescent, silvery leaves, tubular orange flowers or red flowers. And again, it grows from a corm or tuber. And there's a whole band of people who absolutely love these plants. So the range of these plants is mainly in South America. So Dave's going to fill me in on how these plants grow in the wild and why they're just such fascinating plants to bring into your home. My name is David Gaitland. I'm a scientist at the University of Kentucky. I've worked as a plant geneticist and plant molecular biologist for a very long time. And I was fortunate to be able to mix my personal interest in syningias with my professional work as well. I've grown plants for many, many years. And I think I bought my first syningia when I was in college, the year that I went to Cornell University. And I've grown just about every species that's become available. And I've been to Brazil a half a dozen times. Uh, I think five of those I went on field trips. And so I've seen them in person and I've done quite a bit of plant breeding and some genomics with Syningia. Dave, I'm so excited to have you on the show to talk about this wonderful genus. But let's start off by defining our terms. What are Syningias? Where do they grow in the wild? And what marks them out as a genus? The center of diversity of the genus is Brazil, particularly the southern part of Brazil along the Atlantic coastal forest. There are a few species of, of about, well, I, I like to say there's around 75 species. The genus expanded uh, rapidly in, uh, starting in around you know, the very late 80s or early 90s, mainly through the efforts of the botanist from Switzerland and Alain Chaton. He not only has discovered uh, many things and named new discoveries, but also he uh, made new combinations taxonomically and just reclassified things, syningias that were basically misclassified. And most of the species are found in Brazil. There are a few species that range outside uh, Brazil. One particular, I think it's syningia incarnata, if I'm, unless I'm wrong. It's, uh, it's a tall growing species that I think grows as far north as southern Mexico. So basically, they're uh, New World tropical plants. And what's really interesting about the genus is that it's incredibly diverse in terms of growth habit, size, geez, you name it. Syningias range in size from some of the very smallest uh, uh, terrestrial plants to uh, species that can be a meter tall or more. In terms of commercial use, many species are available to a hobbyist, but the general, in terms of co uh, commercial uh, species, really the only one that uh, most people would know of is what something called the Gloxinia, which are the cultivated forms of Syningia speciosa. And these have been around in their present form oh, for well over 100 years, since certainly the later latter part of the 19th century. Some people may wonder why they're called Gloxinias, and that's an unfortunate uh, error of taxonomy. Before they kind of the modern era of scientific publication, there was no such thing as peer review. And so in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries, people would discover new plants 
bring them back to their institutions, look at them, see what they thought they were related to, and then uh, possibly give them names, put them in a genus. And so that's what happened with Cheninja speciosa. These florist galoxinia are a real blast from my past. They were very popular in the late 70s and 80s when I started growing houseplants. Do you think there's a chance they might come back into fashion? They're not so widely available as they used to be, are they? It's hard to say. I remember also in the 1970s, they were available just about any florist or plant shop, even you know, somewhat later uh, around in the U.S. here. Large grocery stores often have a flower, florist, plant kind of section, and to find them there. Now we see them, we might see them here around, commercially grown ones around Mother's Day. And it, it's kind of funny, I mean, there has been a lot of development, a lot of breeding work um, in this species. Uh, some people may know of Charles Lawn, who was a longtime uh, breeder of prize-winning glossinias in Australia. He passed away a few years ago. When he, I think he was 95 or 96. Um, much of his material is still available, at least as seeds. I will say that if you look on, on Facebook on some of these plant groups, uh, there are plenty of, of people who are growing. In fact, there are several uh, groups on Facebook that are devoted specifically to Sininja speciosa uh, and, and as Floxinia as it's a cultivated form as well. Um, so it doesn't, if you look there, it doesn't seem that there's much of a lack of interest. But commercially, you, if you want them, you either have to give them a seed or mail order them. It's not like Streptocarpus and other uh, Gisneria genus that are so very popular. And certainly, in, I know in, in uh, Great Britain, the Nibleys in, uh, in Wales, right? They grow zillions of them. Yeah, and looking on social media, I can see that they're still seem to be popular in places like Iran and Russia and parts of Eastern Europe. So they haven't gone away entirely. And I'd love to see them back. They're just so delightfully over the top. Well, the great thing is that they haven't really gone away. They're just kind of, uh, I wouldn't say they're in hiding, but, you know, they're mainly enthusiasts uh, like myself have them. I moved many years ago, after, especially after going to Brazil, interest in the in the wild forms of Sininja speciosa. There are many, many discrete wild populations throughout, uh, well, so several states in, in Brazil. And I visited uh, probably about 20 of them. So to me, that was very interesting because there's a lot of uh, genetic variation between populations, not, not much within populations, but a lot between populations. So from a geneticist standpoint, that's very interesting. So, Dave, you've seen these species growing in the wild in Brazil. What kind of landscapes do they tend to be found in? Well, that's the one thing, a good thing about some is in general, they don't grow on land that people want to farm. There's a number of species that are epiphytic that grow on, you know, trees and houses. But uh, the vast majority of these plants grow on rocky slopes, which are generally not good for agriculture. I have Many photographs of Sininja, especially Sininja speciosa, growing on rocks where I guess the tubers are kind of embedded in mossy growth or pockets of, uh, you know, humus or I wouldn't even say soil. But I have seen some some uh, population of the Sininja speciosa, especially one of them was above us. We had a hike up through a coffee plantation and up at the top, there was an area where there was. Uh, some trees and a lot of bromeliads, and then down amongst the litter were plants of Sininja speciosa doing just fine above this coffee plantation. So some of them they are in soil, especially around the coastal area of let's see southeastern coastal region of Rio de Janeiro state. There's a, well, a, a cape that sticks out into the Atlantic, Cabo Frio. There's some towns on there. All along that coastal area, there are populations of Sinigia speciosa that are distinct from ones in Rio. Most of them seem to be growing on, on slopes in soil. But in general, slopes and, and bodies of water, they usually tend to grow close to bodies of water, like creeks or, uh, in this case, on the coast, so in the ocean, uh, probably because they like the humidity. So how does that all translate in terms of how we treat Sinigia speciosa as a house plant? then? The nice thing about Sinigia is, is that they grow very well in the same environments that humans are happy in. I recommend that people grow them if they can get a plant light. They do very well there. 
as I said, in the wild, they don't grow in pots, but that's how we have to grow them. And mo- most of the people in that I know are good growers in the Denarian Society, and I should say people who are much better growers than me, uh, they usually use peat-based, you know, kind of a fibrous organic uh, type potting mixes with usually some perlite. Uh, you want it to be pre-draining. The thing about me and some of my uh, my friends, we're the lazy growers. I mean, I have syringes that have been in the same pots for, you know, a decade. <laughs> the nice thing about them is that they go through seasonal growth cycles and they uh, are very uh, reliable. They grow, you know, once or twice a year. They produce foliage and flowers. And then when they, they, be, they go dormant for a little while and then it starts again. So is that dormancy period desirable? Is that something you want to encourage? Or can you keep the plant going if you want to? Well, some will continue to produce shoots from the tuber, some species of syringia. But in general, I, I don't really know why they would go dormant. Uh, it might correspond to uh, the more dry times there in their habitat. I'm not really sure why that is. Um, some seem to have extended periods of dormancy, and uh, but, but many of them, uh, I would say that the many of the wild syringia speciosas that I grow uh, probably have two to three cycles of growth and blooms in a, within a 12 month period. So uh, they're either coming up from the tuber, going into bud, flowering, or then starting to decline. So that takes a number of months. I like that feature on houseplants. I know not everybody does, but I like houseplants that go dormant because it means there's something different going on. They're looking different throughout the year and I find that appealing. I know not everyone likes to see a bear pot, but I think it, I don't know, it's exciting when they, you see the first signs of life coming back. I think that's a, for me, that's a really good part of enjoying those kind of plants. Yes, and they and they renew themselves, you know, every time. Exactly. Like you're not looking at, le- if you don't have to worry about leaf damage or anything, because like like you would do with a I don't know aroids or something because the leaves are going to disappear and you're going to get a fresh set which, <laughs> which I like. As the plants get older, as the tubers get larger, they can produce a heck of a lot more flowers. Sometimes they'll produce a number. Uh, as they get bigger and bigger, they produce more stems. So you, yeah, the plants can continue to get quite quite a bit larger over time. Also, the other species that I think lots of listeners wanted to know about. Uh, is the Leuco Tricker. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing that right. Leuco Tricker, I'm going to go with that. There's no wrong or right answers on that, really, are there on this pronunciation business. Uh, what can you tell us about this species? This seems to be the one that, as opposed to speciosa, that everyone does seem to want to grow. What can you tell us about that one? Well, okay, it comes from, I believe it's in the Sao Paulo state, grows uh, on rocks uh, around waterfalls and things like that, places that are kind of inaccessible to most people. Um, you know, it, it hasn't really fallen out of favor. It's always been kind of there. Um, I don't have it at the moment, but I know uh, many people in the Nerd Society grow it, and it's very long-lived. I think I know somebody who has a 30- or 40-year-old plant at least. Um, they get to, now, where you see it in this country is if you go to a big cactus and succulent shows for some reason they grabbed onto it many years ago because of they like you know many of those succulent growers like caudexes you know what that is big thick swollen usually water storing stems and they call that tuber of that syringia leucotrica they call that a caudex which is probably incorrect but um, when they get nice and big and you raise them up above the soil and put the thing in a big expensive uh shallow like bonsai type pot uh they look pretty impressive with lots of stems on them um for some reason the cactus people insist i think even to this day on calling it rexenaria leucotrica rexenaria was a oh it's a defunct genus that was actually i think it was absorbed into officially absorbed into syningia about well 1973 and, and so anyway, they, sometimes you, you still see that name in the succulent world, but it's a very nice species. And uh, to my knowledge, it's pretty much only propagated through seed. Uh, it's not one of the species that you can take a stem off and root it or root a leaf and get a tuber. 
uh, not to my knowledge, it's just it's best grown from seed. Uh, and they usually take a, a couple of years, I think, to to get uh, to the point where they'll they'll produce a big uh, you know show of flowers. But older plants can be very very impressive. It's still available from seed. I, I should say that the uh, Mauro Peixoto, uh, the Brazilian plant enthusiast, who he he runs a website called Brazil Plants. I know that he has several wild collections of it. You can get a seed from him. I just love the leaves on Leucotrica. They're like soft. They're a bit like Stachys lanata in the garden, just really soft and furry. The flowers, sort of those red flowers are nice, but it's the leaves that do it for me. I think a lot of people like the combination and those really soft bunny ears when they first start growing. One other species of Sinningia I wanted to ask you about was Sinningia bullata, which has this incredible corrugated foliage. What can you tell me about that one? Yeah, those are, I mean, bullata, you know, there's the word bullate. Um, that's that quilted corrugated, that describes the leaf surface, the way they're, they're kind of incised there. And that's, that's pretty unique among Sinningias. And they, it has a really nice, very lovely uh, orange tubular flower with, uh, unlike uh, Leucotriga, the, you know, the petal lobes are larger, so it's a, it's a bigger flower. And it grows in a, see, it's in this, actually it's an island city called Florianopolis. Uh, it, it was pictures from the wild, it grows kind of a chain of tubers kind of coming down a rocky slope or a cliff. And so that's why in cultivation, it just, it, you just can't make it like be a nice pot plant. Um, you can grow nice specimens of it, but it's not going to be a nice tidy rosette. It's going to ramble around a bit. Well, but there's, there's a, another wrinkle here. And like I say, it's been in cultivation maybe 20 years. It's pretty easy to grow. I have a big old one here. It makes a nice big fat tuber. And sometimes, especially if you have it like in a greenhouse, it may never really be without foliage or flowers. Uh, stems will new will produce and the old ones will die off. But about let's see, in 2014, um, a young fellow in Brazil, Gabriello Gabriello Emilio Ferreira. Uh, I don't remember where he was a student, but anyway, he's very interested in Indias. He found a population of that about 200 of that species about well at least 200 kilometers south of uh, the original one. And it grows in a in a canyon, a little bit inland uh, from the coast, where the plants grow on kind of you know, ledges and rocks. Um, many of them in in full sun, and so the very high light levels. But interesting, that form from that area does not really ramble at all. And I recently got seed of that, and I have some growing. For some reason, they haven't flowered for me, but they definitely do not have the growth habit of the original collection. So um, what I intend to do is to cross the two, because it looks like the original one may be a lot more floriferous, and then just select out in the F2, I'll self, self probably self-pollinate the, the hybrid between the two forms and get the F2 generation and just look for a tidier growing highly floriferous version because the the leaves are very very same they they have uh you know what trichomes are leaf hairs yeah so on the under surface of the leaves and along the stems these things are just as woolly as they can be and uh, so both forms seem to have that it's which may have something to do with protecting their plant from high light or levels or from some kind of uh, something that might chew on it. We don't really know, but they certainly have extravagantly developed trichomes. Yeah, there's still so much we just don't know about a lot of these species, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, most plants have not been studied. Uh, and the funding that's available to study plants is mainly for plants that we eat, you know, crops and maybe forestry and other applications. But one thing I forgot to, to you'd asked before about ninjas in the wild, other plants you find with them. And like I said, the, these plants are adapted to grow mainly on slopes and on rocks. Um, they don't apparently compete well with fast growing things like grasses. They'll get swamped out. So that's why they grow maybe where they grow, they grow where they do. 
one thing you do find, I, I don't, I can't tell you how many kinds of begonias I've seen in, in areas where syningias grow in these habitats. And also surprisingly, you'll find cacti that some of these kind of cereoid type cacti that will, um, I don't know, I guess a seed finds, you know, germinates in a crack on a rock and then you've got this cactus sticking up out of the rock and then there's syningias growing around it. And, and also you find a lot of, um, Spike moss, you know, Selaginella. Yeah, find a lot of those around there. Sometimes I think Syningia tubers are embedded in those spike mosses that have been there for a long time. So we're talking about rocky landscapes for a lot of these Syningias in the wild. I wonder how that relates to watering in the home setting. I know a lot of people do wick watering. I can't really say. I've never wick watered, but I know many people who do. I would just tend to keep it damp. Generally, Leucotrica would uh, certainly would grow, grows around waterfalls and things. So it's probably getting constant supply of some kind of, of, of moisture. Um, many Syningias, kind of as a generality, that grow on these large granite hills in, in southern Brazil. It's where a lot of our uh, bathroom countertops, kitchen countertops come from also, by the way. Um, so these granite hills have their own kind of floristic uh, complement. And so many of the syningias uh, grow on those. And I've been to them and kind of, some of you can kind of climb up, climb up a little bit. They often always have water kind of just slowly trickling over the surface. Because I think granite, I guess it's not very absorbent. So water that uh, fell on the top of these big things will then trickle down. And so the plants, I think in those environments, now, they don't have a lot of roots because they're growing on the rock, but they have a constant supply of water. Uh, but in captivity, most syningias, is, I didn't mean captivity, I meant cultivation. You have them in a pot with a you know, peat-based potting mix. They, they can take some drying out, especially if they have a good-sized tuber. But you can also see them generally, uh, syningia speciosa, as an example, that you can tell if they're uh, suffering from from lack of water, especially if they're in flower, the flowers are the first things to wilt. Just going back to the beginning of the interview, what do you think it was about syningias that first drew you in? Well, that's a, an unknowable question. <laughs> it's been it's been you know forty plus, it's maybe forty years since I wandered into a little plant shop on the what's called the Commons in Ithaca, New York, uh, and I bought a little what I what I now uh, soon found out was a one of the, what they call miniature syningias. That's another whole world in syningias of these tetraploids, which were created, well, we started in the mid 60s, crossing syningia eumorpha, which is a really nice uh, rosette type species, similar looking to wild speciosa. They can be anywhere, anywhere from white to dark lavender. Uh, cross that with some of the very small, what they call the micro miniature, syningia pusilla, syningia concina. And these initial hybrids were much larger than the micro miniatures, but much smaller than Syningia eumorpha. They became the foundation of a whole large group, if you call them miniature Syningia today. And what happened was with the original, the those original F1 hybrids were sterile. The parents were not closely related. But then through, I think, in, at least in one case, the use of colchicine, uh, so the, doubled the chromosome number uh, and restored it to fertility as a tetraploid. So, and then there were some other micro miniature crosses with, I think uh, Leucotrica was one of them, which brought in a kind of reddish uh, uh, flower gene. And so there are, there's a whole range of these and you can, you can find these through uh, uh, some, some plant dealers have quite a few of them. And then oh, I, uh, 20 some odd years ago, somebody, Found one with a doubleish flower and, and developed what we now know. We we'll now have a, a range of double flowered miniature syningias. And like you, I, I'm not really wild about them. In speciosa, some of the, the, the double flowers are so heavy that the stems can't really support them very well. And, and some of them are just plain ugly. You know, sorry. <laughs> I know it's probably just as difficult as choosing a favorite child, but is there any particular syningia species that you're most fond of? Well, I have done a lot of work, spent a, you know, a lot of effort with, with speciosa and particularly the wild forms. I have some beautiful wild type uh, syningia speciosa 
that I've bred that have dark foliage and with light veins and dark rose pink flowers, you know. And what do we need to know about propagation of syringes? Are we talking growing from seed, vegetative? Seeds are very small. I don't know how many you can get in a thimble, but it might be many thousands. Um, they're bigger than orchid seeds, but uh, it comes from the survival strategy of the plant. You put out an awful lot of seeds in the hope that a few of them will produce uh, you know, viable adults. But um, no, I, I, I grow them. I, I can't really tell you a whole lot about vegetative propagation because I grew mostly from seed. That's why I try to breed syningias that would be, uh, say, true breeding cultivars so we can grow them from seed. Because many of the hybrids, that, uh, not just in syningia, but many other uh, uh, genera, cisnerids, um, people make all kinds of crosses, find something they like, name it, and then hopefully be able to propagate it vegetatively either by hip cuttings or leaves, or in some cases, rhizomes. They tend to produce some cholerias and uh, smithianthus and things produce a lot of underground rhizomes, which you can break apart and uh, distribute those. But the problem with in India is you can't really divide tubers that, that well, not like quite like a potato. Some people have, I don't like doing that because you can lose both of them, you know. Um, and some you can, uh, the Tinnitus speciosa, you can root the leaf petioles and they will generate a tuber from there. And in many cases, that tuber then will, um, will produce uh, shoots of its own. Um, I've done a lot of that with, with a few uh, uh, species. Um, some are very easy to root, uh, say, as term, you know, the end of a shoot, like tip cutting. And often I root them in water and then put them in soil. Uh, Syningia velosa, I've propagated it an awful lot that way because I haven't had much luck getting any viable seed from it, uh, that species. But um, uh, I prefer growing from seed. So um, that's where growing from seed in uh, Syningia is uh, where you should have a fluorescent or some kind of plant light because you can give them, you can do it inside, you can give them very even uh, temperatures and a, a supply of light. Um, they need humidity, and once they germinate, you know, when they first start getting maybe their first sets of true leaves, uh, first or second set, then you can pull them out. I, I put them in little uh, six-pack things you can get at a nursery, and then uh, when they grow and when they're crowding each other there, then I usually put them in three to four-inch pots, depending on what they are and how big they are, how big I expect them to get. Yeah, so I, I've grown, oh gosh. And maybe tens of thousands of plants from seed over many de many decades. Well, if you have a good source of seed, you know, a tiny pinch could give you more than a hundred plants. I don't like to throw healthy plants away, so I end up with too many. Well, I wish I lived around the corner from you, Dave, because I would certainly be popping over for some plants. Thanks so much for joining me today, and I'm looking forward to chatting further in an extra leaf. But for now, thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks so much to my guest, David. That's all for this week's episode. Do remember to send in your questions for the Q&A special and subscribe to the Plant Ledger, my email newsletter. There's a new edition out today. Until next Friday, have a great week. Bye. in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Young by Komiku and Namaste by Jason Shaw All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons Visit the show notes for details Music